Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, we're going to take a look at the new Off-Grid Knives Grizzly version 2. In Knife Life News, we'll see Ethan Becker's new interpretation of the Nesmuk, and then 11 timeless knife designs. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment from this past week is a long one, but definitely worth the read, uh, especially given the kind of topics of conversation we have on this show. This was uh, a um, comment on my YouTube short about folding Karambit or folding Pakal. Which would you pick in a confrontation? And RPJII9771 said, being formal, former federal law enforcement with five and a half years as a deep undercover operative group one UCO for those familiar, uh, combined with 26 plus years as a senior CQO CQB instructor, that's close quarters battle, I guess, uh, while having been involved in three knife slash blade encounters while undercover, I would select neither of those two knives. One would never ever use a folder or auto as a self-defense knife. That only happens in YouTube or in the movies, LOL. Secondly, the Karambit is one of the worst choices for a fighting knife. A folder even worse, LOL. The Karambit was invented and used as a farming tool, not as a fighting knife. It was only morphed into one due to the fact that the farmers had no money to purchase a legit fighting knife, so they used what they had. I still do carry fixed blade Pical as it was the only knife slash punch dagger of the six fixed blade knives slash daggers on my person that I was able to deploy in two of my three encounters. That's pretty interesting there. Uh, if I had carried a folder auto as my self-defense knife, I would not have made it out of the first confrontation, LOL. <laughs> as most normal people, quote unquote, uh, we'll never have to deal with a real world knife fight. Thank God. That's my own uh, editorial or psychopath blitz attacking them with a fixed blade. Uh, they can run around carrying flicking, flipping any blade they like, and it doesn't matter. LOL. Uh, may God help them if <laughs> I'm sorry. May God help them if it ever does. As always, just my three cents worth. Stay safe, RP. I, I really do appreciate this uh, comment because. Uh, I'm more apt to trust my fellow uh, brother and sister out there with real world experience than I am, uh, you know, people who like to push certain products or people who have certain ideas or movies themselves. Uh, movies are great. They're fun to watch. Uh, also, when you do uh, martial arts and you get used to self-perfection techniques and you start thinking that they're self-preservation techniques the muddy uh, the waters can get muddied but comments like this are really helpful because presuming this is all legit and all real kind of doesn't matter it's it is good advice uh the the actual drawing and using of a, a folding knife that's not waved and even that uh even that seems like it could be a real problem in a pinch um, so anyway, I really like this uh, comment. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, putting a little bit of reality and a little bit of this person's perspective to that uh, question, folding Pakal or folding Karambit. Thank you one and all uh, for the viewers of this channel and people who have commented. It's it's always great to read them and uh, especially ones like this. All right. All that said, after that long one, it's time to get to a pocket check. Well, for self-defense in my front pocket <laughs> was exactly what was uh, not recommended. Uh, so actually, I am now carrying fixed blades as my as my uh, as my as my um, self-defense knives. This one is uh, a great utility blade. This was in my front right pocket. This is the TR3 from Protec, uh, the Tactical Response Three, uh, a, a classic at this point from ProTech and just a very clean drop point design, 154 CM aluminum handle um, and that amazing ProTech action. Uh, this is this is a, 
um, knife that I put in my pocket that I feel both fancy and 100% tactical. And I say that because uh, I saw a soldier once talking about his TR3 and how he lost it in the sand and found it like a year later and it was still working, still a great knife. And that's what turned me on to this uh, in the beginning was that testimonial. Uh, but, um, you know, it's a it's a real luxury item. It, it thwacks out with authority. It's not inexpensive. Uh, but what a great carry uh, is this ProTech. Nice and light, too. All right. Next up on me, I had uh, the little bro from Jack Wolf Knives. I'm, I'm, I dig this knife, especially in the summer. I keep finding myself carrying it because it is just a little bit smaller. Uh, it does go in the same size leather slip as every other Jack Wolf knife, uh, but it it in profile is smaller because the leather is sort of pressed around the blade, and it's just a little bit lighter. And uh, psychologically, it's smaller too. I mean, it's physically smaller, but it it has a smaller feel in hand. Look at that beaut. So Jack Wolf knives are now all in fancy carbon fiber. Uh, I am lucky to have a good number of them in my carta. I'm lucky to have uh, a, a nice collection of them. Thank you, Ben Belkin, for that. Uh, so I had this beauty in my pocket. What else did I have? I had this beauty in my waistband. And uh, this is the Nova One. Uh, blade designed by me on the platform, designed by Hogtooth Knives. A uh, Just a great, great everyday carry. This one I have moved, like most knives, up to the front. Um, unless it's big, I'm not carrying it at the three o'clock anymore. A lot of it has to do with uh, what the gentleman uh, was saying in the comment uh, in terms of A, having a fixed blade and B, having it readily available. You don't need to be searching around. Uh, that was a pretty an uh, alarming statistic that he could he could access two out of six and they were all fixed and all on his person. Um, anyway, had this one on me. This is a great, uh, I love carrying this. It feels good. I hate to say this next to my skin, next to my belly. Uh, that thing will be, uh, that handle is nice and smooth and it's, uh, it's comfortable. Let me put it that way. Um, I have a number of fixed blade knives that I carry in that same position that if I don't have a t-shirt between the handle and my skin, it's quite uncomfortable. Not so with the Nova one. And then for emotional support, oh, I had an extra one on me today, actually. Uh, in this, in my pocket, I had the Fudo Forge um, scalpel. An impulse buy at the Fudo Forge table. They make beautiful, uh, at Plato this year, they make beautiful chef's knives and, and uh, outdoor knives. Uh, but they had these little $30 scalpels as uh, impulse buys right by their cards. So, of course, I had to buy one. I wrapped it with jute, dropped, uh, made a little drop sheath goes in the pocket and uh, it's a great little handy as hell hidden knife actually uh yesterday i used this to cut wrapping paper i had three uh birthday gifts to wrap and uh it was very precise and very sharp and then for emotional support on me today that is for for fidgeting and just general appreciation i had the holiday from finch knives a great great uh, modern take on modern flipping take on the doctor's knife, a doc holiday, hence holiday with the two L's. It's not holiday, like going on holiday, uh, great knife. And also, um, could flex into that Pakal style. If you, if you manage to bring it to bear, um, could be a great, uh, Great little knife for that. But like all Finch knives, very, very charming. Look at this. I had uh, I had a Warncliffe, a drop point, a, two clip points, and a scalpel on me. What did you have on you today? Uh, drop that down in the comments below and uh, let me know. Also, um, and I'm not going the down the watch avenue, but I'm interested uh, if anyone has uh, an Arnie watch the Seiko Arnie watch. Very interested in that as Commando is one of the greatest movies of all time. And I loved that watch uh, when I was a buddy young pup. And I, I, I have one now sitting in my Amazon uh, bin for, for weeks now. Does anyone have the Seiko Arnie? Should I get it? All right. Thank you for your advice there. Still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at some Knife Life news, including uh, something cool from Ethan Becker. Uh, but that's not unusual. And then we will get to the state of the collection. 
uh, coming up right here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife, and we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit the knifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So new from K-Bar and Ethan Becker. You know Ethan Becker and K-Bar. What a, what a timeless collaboration. Uh, sort of timeless. I, they don't appear in my list later, but uh, they have been, that collaboration has been, uh, has been going for about 20 years now. Uh, I had one of the early ones. I gave it to a friend in New York and uh, I can't remember, BK6, I think it was. They're amazing knives and they kind of keep coming over the years. The newest one is from, Eth uh, from Ethan Becker is this Nesmuk. It's his in uh, interpretation of the Nesmuk. So you have uh, the K bar recipe of um, full tang, uh, 1095 Crovan steel coated, uh, Cerakoted, so so as not to rust. And you have the GRN uh, handle scales there. This is the BK 19, and uh, it it has the sweep on the spine of a Nesmuk and that curve, but the rest of the blade to me is a little bit more. Well, it's it's a lot more of a utility knife, but it's a lot more point driven to me, which makes it feel a little bit more like a military or tactical knife. Um, yes, Bob, everything, you know, that's my lens. So, so forgive me if that's a, a ridiculous thing. Uh, Mr. Becker is not, uh, does not seem, he's a really cool guy. I got a chance to meet him. Um, also, by the way, you know, he helped write, uh, the, uh, the joy of cooking. I'm not sure if you knew that. Uh, I found that out and was, happily surprised anyway this this new uh kephart bk19 comes in a nice uh, injection molded sheath i love the color that that sort of desert tan i would love to see this in a longer blade um but that's just you know me uh a great overall outdoor knife with that uh, nice big belly and the center line point which um you know, you can definitely use that for a lot of uh, outdoor things, having that point in the middle, sort of drilling applications and such. And with the rounded sort of handle, um, well, I'm not going to speak to outdoor, to to uh, to bushcraft stuff. That's about where where I end. I, I think it's a good looking knife and it looks more uh, like a like a combat knife than a lot of the other BKs, in my opinion. OK, next up, uh, Custom Knife Factory is now celebrating its 10th birthday. And uh, they are doing so with a design called the OK. It's OK. Uh, from Alexi Konijin. I think that's how you pronounce his name. But he is a, a big time uh, and longtime collaborator with Custom Knife Factory. If you don't know, Custom Knife Factory is a Russian outfit uh, known for its small batch, very high end production knives from from just, you know, incredible designers. And looking at this uh okay folder you see that blue timascus on the side there that is the clip side scale and the clip so uh connie Jin is known for his really complex folder builds and designs and uh this is a nice little tip of the hat to to not only his complex designs but it, it's like everything um custom knife factory comes out with is a, a proving how great their milling and um, uh, building skills are. Look, this is a, thanks, Jim. This is a good view down on the knife where you can see uh, that it's asymmetrical. And you can see that right-hand side is A, the clip, and B, the scale, and also a gorgeous piece of, um, of uh, Timascus. Very nice, uh, high-peaked, uh, futuristic sort of sheep's foot blade. And uh, just a, a cool little thing to put on your list if you're a, a fan of Custom Knife Factory. No doubt it will be very, very low in in number, production number. And I think it's coming out, uh, I think they said end of August. So mark your calendars. Yeah, ETA is August. Mark your calendars. Uh, that's the OK, and it's just OK 
from uh, Custom Knife Factory. Just kidding. Looks beautiful. All right. Uh, next up is an interesting and quirky design from Boker and uh, Custom Knife Maker slash designer Henning Markson. And it's called the Gearhead. It's, it's sort of a slip joint, except it's not a slip joint at all. I think it's a slip joint in that it does not lock. Uh, but if you look at this three-stage sort of illustration here uh, from the Boker website, you can see that uh, it, it's basically the shape of a credit card, sort of uh, like a um, dog tag style knife from Spyderco, where the blade is is visible on one side. So you open it up, and what keeps it open and what allows it to open is a gear pattern under that uh, under that plate there. At the pivot you can see hints of the gear on the very right hand knife there you can see a couple of teeth there um but you can one-handed open it with that sort of uh, tab there and uh and then you get a really odd looking knife uh, d2 blade steel that's a g10 on the handle side uh, but the real interesting uh, thing the usp here is that gear gear thing so hence the gear head uh when is this around is this available gearhead is slated for release in the latter half of 2023 all right so latter half of 2023 and i guess we're in that half so keep your eyes peeled all right last up i just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that uh that knife rights their um app legal blade uh has uh is being re-released in its 3.0 and uh um 3.0 what do you say iteration this is a really amazing app that breaks down uh, knife laws across all 50 states. Um, this thing, this thing, this app was um, co-sponsored by Blade HQ and, and uh, Blade HQ has mentioned that they get calls and emails. This is Mark Christensen, the CEO of Blade HQ, says Blade HQ was thrilled to work with Knife Rights Foundation on the development and sponsorship of this app. That's Legal Blade 3.0. We regularly get calls from customers in certain areas of the country with questions about what knives they can own and what knives they can carry in their pocket. Customers traveling across state lines have similar questions. Helping with the sponsorship and development of this app was an easy way for us to get this information out to knife owners across the country. So a, a really nice, uh, a, well, a boon to Blade HQ, no doubt. Uh, they don't have to answer as many of those calls. But really an excellent thing for all of us <clears throat> because uh, who among us isn't a little bit baffled by the intricacies of our local and state knife laws. Um, so go check out uh, Legal Blade and download it 3.0. It is free. Um, I have done so. I've not cracked it open yet though, but uh, I will be looking at that. Uh, I know that in Virginia, the knife laws over the past two years have changed significantly due to knife rights. So it'll be cool to see that reflected on my screen. All right, that's it for Knife Life News. Uh, if you'd like to help support the show, something you can do is go over to Patreon and check out the three different tiers of support we have there and the different things you get. My my favorite offering uh, is, is, uh, is something that any tier of support gets, and that is the exclusive interview extras. So every time I interview someone like, say, for instance, Lynn Thompson, who's the interview this week, uh, I do an extra little bit of time and ask questions that I didn't have a chance to ask or sometimes aren't appropriate for the wider podcast. And um, so anyway, that's a perk. So check it out. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code on your screen. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've been around this channel for any length of time, I'm sure you're familiar with this knife here. This is the 
off-grid knives grizzly and this is a camp slash kitchen knife it's a really great uh, excuse me for the cracking voice of it it's really great i've taken it on vacation uh, for a number of summers in a row it's just a great chef's knife and you can bang around it with it in the woods even though bushcraft is not suggested for this knife well anyway in their usual sort of um push for uh, constant improvement in design and build uh, off-grid knives has come out with a version two of the grizzly and i have this version of it right here i'm really excited about this improved sheath as usual this is a great taco sheath with a great push off on the thumb and excellent retention and a uh, a really good belt loop here that you can take off and swap out if you don't like uh but here it is this is the new off-grid grizzly v2 and man the improvements are there let me show let me show them off to you um the first thing you might notice right away is that, like most chef's knives, it is a full height flat grind. So that's a full flat grind there on this new off-grid Grizzly. This one, instead of OS 8 blade steel, which is the first one I was in OS 8, this one is now in 14C28N, a great blade steel, much loved by many. And then the ergonomics of the handle are really improved. Now, this is a trend you're seeing across the whole off-grid knives product line, but the handles are going from somewhat boxy to relatively contoured. Uh, I say somewhat boxy because they're I wouldn't characterize them as boxy, but with the releases of the version twos of most of the knives, the uh, contouring is becoming more noticeable and more pronounced. And you definitely feel that here. And it's just a slightly uh, thinner grip, slightly less broad with that with those uh, with those choils there, those little swales for your fingers, and it feels more like a chef's knife um, in in that sort of pinch grip, like this that you find yourself using a lot. Uh, something I love here. This is a two and a quarter inch thick uh, or broad blade. It's a great platform to pick up all of those onions you just diced. Uh, to drop them in the pan. Um, I love the off-grid Grizzly. And this this is definitely feels like a nice improvement. A little bit more of a belly here. Gives you a little bit more to rock, you know, area to rock on a flat surface. Um, now, I'm, I have to mention that um, off-grid knives does go out of their way on this iteration to say this is not a bushcraft knife. Do not go bang. Uh, bang this through logs. This is not for batoning and, and stuff. They don't get that specific, but I think the point is it's really intended more for camp kitchen, you know, uh, meaning it's something you can drop in your sheath and you can do all sorts of light, light utility tasks with. Um, and, and I would say to include carving and light chopping personally, uh, at least I have with that OS eight. So, um, but you know, it's not a survival knife, basically. Really nice grip. That G10 is contoured so nicely. And then right here, uh, like as in the other one, um, gives you that little ramp for your thumb. So you can do those chest pull things and, and all those kind of... Don't do the chest pulls. It's not a bushcraft. Okay, I got you. But uh, excellent knife. I love it. Go check it out. Also, the jimping has, has been ex extended up the blade another inch. Um, I, you know, I'm always for more jimping. So, uh, nicely done on the off grid knife, uh, off grid knives V2 of the Grizzly. All right. Now the next thing I got was something I've been, I've been wanting for a long time because, oh, where is, it? all right. Well, the original is not here. Uh, I, I used to have the FGX, uh, Karambit, uh, steel tiger in the shower. I took that out. I showed that off last week on Ringed Things. And in making that video, Ringed Things, it really got me back into that knife. And I, I thought, you know, I've never, ever had this. It's the Cold Steel Steel Tiger. And this is the Karambit from which uh, the my <laughs> FGX plastic shower knife uh, was, was based. And, you know, uh, I'm very, very picky about rings and how they've, how they fit the fist and if they realign your if you have to change your your fist at all to accommodate it i don't like it 
And I've noticed for years that with the one that we have in our shower, I don't have to. It fits my hand perfectly. So I decided I should just get this. And I got it as a gift to myself um, in commemoration of finally interviewing Lynn Thompson. And what a great interview it was. I, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed talking to him. He's a really nice guy, really great guy, very interesting, smart, and and a total badass. And it was great talking to him. And I feel like given uh, given the longer conversation, he had a chance to open up more. And uh, it was cool. A distal taper on this blade. You can see it starts out pretty fat and then gets nice and thin there. Wickedly sharp. I mean, that is a big blade. That's a big blade for a karambit. You know, we think of karambits as these small small things. Um, yeah, you know, I know a thing or two about using a karambit and I just haven't done it in a long time. So I'm going to shake off some of that dust and not use this. I'm going to use the uh, FGX one as a trainer and start fooling around with it again. It's fun. And, uh, and that's all it is for me is fun. I don't carry a karambit for self-defense. And after reading, uh, that comment today, I will not be, um, most likely carrying one of my folding karambits for self-defense. They're just things of interest and um, maybe areas of self-perfection when it comes to martial arts training. The karambit. All right, let's get into these timeless knife designs. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about my um, stipulations here. They are There are many classic, specific uh knife designs. And I'm going to do that a little bit. Some of these are, are uh, classic knife designs in and of themselves, and others represent a type. So that's what we're doing here. All right. First up in timeless knife designs. Yeah, you may have guessed it. First one I have to do is the Buck 110. Uh, this, is, this is the folding hunter, the Buck 110 folding hunter. And it was supposed to uh, simulate the fixed blade experience uh, using the Buck 119, a famous hunting fixed blade knife. Uh, this has the same style uh, swooping clip point blade, the same 420 blade steel. Uh, this does, uh, I think this has the boss heat treat. Um, and then the uh, heavy and substantial handle. If you've ever held the Buck 119, you know that it's got a very substantial handle. That that plastic material is molded all the way up to the to the sides of the um, of the guard, and it makes it really fat. And I think that that is so that you have something easy to hold on to when your hands are getting slippery uh, from from doing your hunting. Um, you know, dressing out game or, or whatever, skinning animals and such. <laughs> you can tell I'm quite the huntsman. Uh, so yeah, this, this also offered the strength of the back lock. One, still one of the strongest uh, ways to lock up a knife out there. And uh, this is a back lock all the way in the back. Uh, we see now a lot more mid back locks where the lock is right here, like on cold steels. So you can one-handed close them. These are very difficult to one hand close, uh, though you just hold it like this and do it on your jeans and you can close it like that. Uh, something funny, Rob Bixby, uh, the Apostle P said in his video about the Buck 119, he was like, this is the original tactical folder. This is the original redneck tactical folder. He was saying like, and he was saying redneck lovingly, you know, basically like this has been on the hip. Uh, in the pouch on the hips of country boys for a long time and therefore protection and everything else. Um, so, uh, you know, when we talk about other modern tactical designs, this is the one that basically started it all for, for the really sturdy folding uh, locked knife, uh, not including some of the, uh, some of the earlier ones. This is the one that popularized them. The buck 110. Okay. So next up is a pocket knife. Very, very, what do we want to say? Ubiquitous pocket knife. That is the case trapper or any trapper, but case really is the one that I feel has made this one uh, famous and uh, the, the one to emulate. Um, let me turn this down one so we can see that yellow Delrin. Love that yellow Delrin. You see that on, on their CV models. Um, and, and it's a, uh, First of all, that yellow Del Rin is a
long time had that yellow Delrin um, series for the CV. That's chrome vanadium um, steel knives. That chrome vanadium is basically 1095. I think it's been determined. And um, it patinas so nicely. It also takes an incredible edge. I feel as if the um, I feel as if case knives takes their CV blades a little bit more seriously. Does a does sort of a better job on the overall builds of these knives. So the the classic trapper is a three and a quarter inch overall um, closed measurement, and then it's got a clip point blade and a um, spay blade spay blade for spaying animals let's not let's not make any mistake about that that's why the tip is sort of blunted like that so you don't poke anything else down there you're not supposed to when you're when you're separating an animal from its genitals uh, so this is in the pocket of uh, many a farmer over many many years uh, for its and not just farmers but for its pure utility uh, in in uh, everyday tasks but also in that very specific farming task. Okay, the next one is from Jack Wolf Knives. So there, so you can see now this is timeless in its design, not necessarily this particular model because they have not been around for a long time. So, but this timeless design is the big bro Jack. And I was carrying the little bro Jack today, but they, they both they both fit. The little bro jack is like a boy's knife. This is just a big classic American jackknife. A nearly three inch blade uh, and a nice big neutral uh, sleeve board pattern handle. Sleeve board pattern um, emulating the, the shape of the sleeve board on an ironing board. Uh, my grandmother, my grandma Tignorelli used to have one where they would uh, open up this door in the kitchen and then the ironing board came down and then there was a secondary board that came down after that. And uh, that was a, the sleeve board. So when you're ironing a shirt, man, I wish we had one of those. Uh, I hate ironing shirts. I just usually just fold and bring it to the dry cleaner. But when I'm feeling industrious and I, I'm ironing my shirts, I'm always jonesing for a sleeve board. Uh, anyway, modern problems. This has really excellent action and really great non-locking lockup so to speak. So it stays open due to that very stiff spring. And man, I keep bumping that. Sorry about that. It's got just great action. You feel very confident in hand with this, that it's not going to close for a couple of reasons. First of all, you're not a mama Luke. You're not using the spine for anything. You're using the blade uh, edge and cutting and going against the, the lock. So it's not going to fold on you for that reason. But also that spring is just so uh, stiff that if you find yourself pushing on the blade with your thumb for whatever reason, you're still, it's not going to, it's not going to fold on you. And if it does, it'll stop at that half stop. Double bolster, classic. I love this thing. And in micarta like this, uh, one of the last micarta knives they put out, um, it really does have that classic American feel and that classic timeless design uh, sort of feel. Uh, because the modern carbon fibers that Jack Wolf Knives uses primarily, they have a more uh, less classic look. Okay, uh, next up, this one is a um, sort of a meta knife, we'll say. Uh, this is the knife that led to, uh, this This and many knives like it are the knives that led to the K-Bar. So that's why I didn't choose the K-Bar for this. I chose a knife that would lead up to it, like a classic clip point American hunting knife um, from the early 20th century. This is a Boone II from Bark River Knives representing that type uh, in a beautiful leather sheath. This one, this past uh, heat wave weekend, I did a lot of work outside and this one was on my hip and I didn't clean it and I meant to because it looks nasty, but uh yeah, this one was on devining uh, duty. It, our our vines are just out of hand, especially this late in the summer. Everything is so lush here in Virginia, and the damn vines, uh, especially the the English ivy, my God, just going crazy, trying to pull trees down and everything. So, I was taking care of business with this, and this is three V steel, one of my few knives in three V, 
and um, it's got that really nice clip point blade it does look a lot like a k-bar doesn't it just a smaller version nice fuller there and uh it being a a bark river knife it's got a apple seed or convex grind which is very very sharp and quite stout so uh this thing does a great job uh, i swung it a number of times uh you know light chopping to to cut things at the at the base near the ground and every time I had just a little bit of pucker for that t uh, for this uh, edge here because so many times I've done that and hit stones and then I regret it. This one didn't happen. And I'm wondering, 3V, sorry about that. 3V is a very uh, tough steel, right? That's one of the properties uh, that people gravitate towards it for outdoors knives, right? So I guess I would have found out if I hit the rock. Love the antique stack leather handle. It's very comfortable. Um, and then you have an aluminum um, guard, double quillion guard and butt cap. And I'm glad that it was aluminum yesterday uh, or, and this past weekend as I was sweating a lot and my arm kept rubbing against this. And I was thinking if that were steel, it would start to uh, it would start to rust and patina. All right. So so we're, we're going to say um, Bark River uh, Boone to to represent the the pre K bar American hunting knife that a lot of GIs were deploying with early in World War II. Okay, next up from Cold Steel, it's the Master Tonto. This is the one that started it all in terms of the American Tonto with that faceted tip. Um, interesting little tidbit. I always thought and assumed that this was Cold Steel's first knife. It wasn't. Cold Steel's first knife was the Urban Skinner. Uh, push dagger learned that in my interview with uh, lynn thompson but this this came shortly thereafter and um and i got this one in the late 80s so this is a a nice uh, early model of this with the with the classic leather sheath i wish i could get a new one um they just are not existing anymore i guess i could have one made uh you got the the tarnished uh brass here so nice. There's the noggin knocker on the back and the Grivex. But what is, why is this a timeless design? It's because it's because of this Tonto shape. That Tonto blade has become uh, a, a staple. It's become a, a regular pattern, so to speak. Just like that uh, trapper, just like that case trapper I was showing you made by millions of different companies, not literally, made by many, many different companies in the same way. Well, that's kind of what happened with the Americanized Tonto. People, uh, different knife makers really recognized, um, Bob Lum was doing this too. It, it wasn't just uh, wasn't just Lynn, Lynn Thompson. There were other knife makers and knife people uh, doing this, but really recognizing the value of that very stout tip in penetration because the big the big combat knife, the big tactical blade up until this point uh, would have been either the K-Bar or, or, you know, the Bowie or the Dagger. And both the Bowie and the Dagger, especially if the Bowie has a sharpened swedge, are going to be finer at the tip and be more likely to break. Uh, we've seen historical examples of uh, Marine Raider Daggers, for instance, where the tip was so acute that the Marines would take it and just round it, round it off so that it wouldn't break and it wouldn't stick in bone if you were fighting and stabbing people. Um, it, was, it was a sharpened rounded tip, but a rounded tip nonetheless. They would make it that way. This, uh, with the new Americanized Tonto, with that chiseled tip, uh, that faceted tip, and that really nice, thick um, tip from the top, prevented any of that sort of breakage, but gives you... Uh, plenty of, of breaching capability. So that has become a, a timeless uh, aspect. And I would say that this knife itself has been copied so many times, just that overall shape, that uh, this also, uh, as an overall knife, uh, is a classic. All right, next up, a folder. Yes, it is the Chris Reeve Knives Sabenza. In this case, the 21, and we're going to stick with the 21. Even if I had a 31, which I'd love to, but I don't, uh, I would still be putting up this 21. Uh, because to me, 
the the first Sabenza came out and then it had a redesign for the 21. And uh I I feel like this is the apotheosis. Is that the right word? So someone tell me what that word means. I've heard it used and I like it. So I gotta I gotta look it up. This is the pinnacle, I would say, of of the Sabenza design. I know the 31, they made some refinements. Uh, or what a lot of people think are refinements, i.e. the um, the ceramic ball interface and um, detent ball and then several other, uh, several. I think maybe the pivot has changed. But this 21 um, is really the quintessential. Uh, and, and this one right here is what introduced the frame lock to the business and to the world. And, and it's pretty much the most coveted form the, the titanium frame lock is what most of our most coveted folders are are made of or or in that format and this is the knife that brought that about uh yes you're saying well it wasn't the 21 it was the earlier one and yeah i guess you're right but overall you'd have to agree the sabenza 21 is a a timeless design and uh everything like the umnamzana everything else that sprung out of it did just that sprang out of this. So uh, this one had a broken tip or I dropped the tip. It didn't have a broken tip. It didn't just happen. I made it happen, but I also made the sharpening happen and sent it off to Jared Neve um, and uh, back in the day. And he put a great edge on it and fixed the tip. So awesome, awesome knife. Okay. What else in this kind of category? Um, I'm thinking of modern, I'm thinking of tactical, I'm thinking of automatic and out the front. Well, there's only one answer to that, and that's the Ultratech by Microtech. Uh, lots of great out the front knives out there, but this one has really uh, become the, I think, the quintessential out the front because it, it does a couple of things. It represents the quali a, a certain quality, that's Microtech. It is, it is within reach. Uh, because it is not super expensive uh, in terms of some of the microtechs out there. And uh, and it has been proven to be... Now, when I say that, it's like a $275 knife or or, or more, depending. I'm, I'm not saying it's inexpensive. Um, but in terms... It's not like... A, it's not like a Sabenza. It's not like some of these other... Uh, some of the other knives. Um, especially for out the front automatics. But but what it has done is sort of simplified the shape and um, and it accepts, it has a bunch of different blade shapes. And what I was trying to get to before I derailed myself was that it's been proven time and time, and time again through tests and abusive tests to be an incredibly stout and capable knife. It's not just a toy, uh, which is kind of, uh, you know, I have it because I like using, I like the action. It's a very cool knife to me. Uh, but if you're going to have one of these, say in Tonto or Drop Point, and use it as a hard use knife, this will go the distance. Uh, that's aluminum. And in this case, you know, they have a pick a special steel. This is M390, M390 blade steel. A very, very nice knife. Uh, this, this one. So to me, it's the dagger. Uh, which makes it timeless also because this is the one context before the um, before Hinderer and before Sharp by Design and before uh, Arcane Designs came out with their folding daggers. This was the only way you were going to get a dagger in a in a folding sort of uh, format. It doesn't fold, but you know what I mean. In a blade hidden in handle format. So that's the Ultratech. And uh, I'm setting that down there. That's my ultra tech has always been a little stiff, much easier with my right hand, which is a stronger. Um, and it, you know, it, it doesn't feel as, as lux as some of the newer models. All right, next up, we're going back in time a little bit. And it's the open L. Uh, this one is the number 10. I would, uh, I would argue the number eight is the true classic. That's the, the one that they sell the most of. And I think that was the original size. They go all the way up to 13, which is immense, and uh, all the way down to like a keychain number one, I think. But just a great knife. It's got a twist collar lock, and uh, that is about as locked open as you can get on a folder. 
you know, it's very simple, simple design. This is French and was originally a peasant's knife or a farmer's knife. Uh, they come in orange beechwood. Is it beechwood? Yeah, I think it's beechwood. Orange beechwood. Uh, and you see people alter them as you see I have done here, put on a, I don't know, my little rock pattern or something and stained it. And this is this is my favorite casual dining steak knife. So we're going out to dinner somewhere and uh, the diner say we're going to our favorite little diner and I think I'm going to get a steak. I'll bring this and uh, love to cut food with this knife. It's a great size. That 1095 steel, high carbon steel really patinas up nicely. Actually, I'm not sure if it's 1095. I do know it's high carbon. Patinas up very nicely. It's so thin, full flat ground and slicey. Also handsome. I think these are great uh, great lookers. I got my um, my mom one years ago. She keeps it in her purse and travels with it and, and all that. It's a great picnic knife, great little uh, folding food knife. I have one at my desk at work that I use for food. Um, the one thing is you want to be careful if, uh, <laughs> I mean, action on, an, on one of these should not be your concern, but uh, you do want to be careful that it doesn't get too wet here because uh, if that wood expands, it can make it more difficult to open. Uh, but I know some people like to try in one hand open their, their open L's. Uh, so yeah, very, very inexpensive, very good knife. And um, the only thing is, yes, I would recommend some sort of alteration to the handle because if you don't, it's totally round. And it will, um, the only thing that saves it from being totally round is the contouring from this perspective. Great knife is the Oppenel, Open L. All right, next up, this could have been kind of almost any Spyderco because at this point, that Spyderco look with the giant opening hole and the weird shaped blade is, is a timeless classic. But in this case, I chose the PM2 uh, because, well, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a knife that has been used for years as a standard of measure when people are reviewing other knives. So I figured that would make this uh that would make this truly the 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 most timeless of the spider codes. Yeah, you might say more people own the Endura or more people have the Delica or the or whatever design, you know, the Tenacious, but this one stands for the most. Plus it's got the incredible innovation of that lock on it. A uh, sort of a version of the liner lock it's the compression lock. It's got a spring-loaded tab here that fits into a notch on the tang. And you would really have to... You see that notch right there in the tang? Let's see if I can get that to focus. Yeah. You would really have to crush the little tab that fits in that steel uh, in that notch to, to make that fail. So the blade itself or the handle, something else will fail before that lock. Uh, so it's innovative in its in its form, but also it's, you know, they put on earth one of the greatest things to fidget with. So I think in terms of timeless designs, there has to be a Spyderco, and I think it's got to be the PM2. What do you think? Uh, I was also thinking about the police model. That was the one that really um, opened my eyes to Spyderco uh, long before, um, say, Cold Steel was making folders. And um, but. I don't think the police model is nearly as um, common, commonly found. God, I gotta, I can't wait to get the military too. All right, two more here. Uh, next one is a uh, is the Spartan Harzi dagger. Now, why did I choose this? Um, it it's it's timeless. Okay, I'll tell you why. It's timeless because uh, it incorporates. Um, a lot of aspects from various daggers throughout history. Uh, that handle, that wasp waisted handle is an improvement on the sort of shape you see on the, um, on the Fairbairn Sykes, but also, which is fully round in cross section. This uh, pinches it off right here at the, uh, at the guard and gives you some jimping and a, and a, makes it so it's not going to turn as much, but still fits the hand. So basically this, this is, this is the quintessential dagger, uh, quintessential modern military dagger. It has, uh, 
it has all of the the right shapes in the handles that that coke bottle wasp wasted handle but also it has the um hollow ground edge that you see in in a classic like the randall number two combat stiletto so you so you can get more than just stabbing out of this you can get slicing and uh and i should say slashing you're not going to get much slicing here uh you've got the medial ridge that gives it real rigidity almost all the way to the tip there um that you see in a classic like the gerber mark ii um so there are a lot of a lot of different elements uh from from various uh classic stilettos and uh daggers that have gone into this design and to me uh, like it even beats the um less george spartan raider dagger for just overall timelessness that 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 dagger i love and i i actually carry it around with me a lot more than this i never carry this one but that one looks too much like a specific thing out of history this one is sort of an amalgamation and a beautiful one um just as a side note bill harsey jr is one of the greatest in my opinion greatest modern knife designers that's his little tree logo next to the spartan hoplite helmet uh bill harsey grew up in a logging family he's a tough tough dude but uh, uh but a really nice guy and designs incredible knives so his his harsey dagger is to me the most timeless of the daggers the modern daggers all right gonna stash this in the beautiful chattanooga leatherworks sheath i love this thing look at this beauty you can also remove this uh belt loop and actually put a uh like a discrete carry clip or something else here i've never done that but it'd be kind of cool to do all right last up yes you know there's got to be a bowie in this lineup um and i racked my brain I was thinking about cold steel they have a lot of great ones i was thinking about tops you know i was thinking about some of these great bowies i have but i kept coming back to this one uh, for the most timeless of bowies i would say it's the western model the western 49 bowie w49 uh, it's got that classic upswept uh curved clip um, that you that you don't see in the cold steel, uh, say um, Trailmaster, for instance. You've got that classic curved clip. This one is unsharpened. Real nice uh, belly that expands towards the uh, apex of the clip here, and gives you a nice uh, sweep for slashing and chopping, and uh, pull cutting and and all sorts of stuff you might want to do with this knife. This one in particular uh, was. Uh, bought uh, this is from 1980 and i know that because of some of the markings here you can you can find what the markings and we there we go you can find out what some of those markings mean there's a d on there that you can't quite see because it's so shiny but there's a d on there uh indicating that this is from 1980 my brother got this at a pawn shop i love the story uh, just because it's from a pawn shop and I just imagine the person who had this was some sort of badass I don't know maybe a motorcycle guy maybe a one percenter owned this knife uh, but whoever did went to great pains to bend this incredibly thick brass quillion down uh, so it would come a little bit further down on the knuckle to protect the finger uh, I say that they went to great pains because I tried to pound it back and I, I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to deform this here where I'm making contact before I bend this. So uh, so someone either did that in a machine shop or something like that, or they fell off their motorcycle at like 120 and it bent while they were rolling. Some sort of anonymous bone uh, on the replacement handle here. I don't know what kind of bone it is, but it always kind of wigs me out just because I don't know what kind of bone it is so i always think the bone of a victim perhaps the femur of a sucker of, of, of a fellow one percenter on the wrong side of the wrong side of the road i don't know but it adds to the mystique of this knife uh, but to me of all bowies that is what first comes to mind i it's not even wouldn't even be my first choice i like the muso style bowie better i like the uh, the long slender fighting style bowies uh, better but but this one to me is the most timeless 
uh, Bowie of all. Uh, so that is it. Uh, I, I know that there are more, and I know I could keep going, but um, these not only represent uh, giants of the knife industry and, and uh, modern knife history, but also uh, they represent some of the, of the knives that, that inspired those kind of historical knives, say like the K-Bar. All right. Thanks for joining me. Let me know. Drop some comments in the uh, drop some suggestions in the comment below for other timeless designs. I know uh, this is all my opinion. I'd love to hear your opinion. Uh, be sure to join us next week for Michael Martin of American Blade Works on Sunday. Uh, great guy. Uh, he's been on the show a couple of times. I've had uh, two of his knives. They are amazing. And we talk about uh, new developments there. And then uh, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And then, of course, Thursday night knives, the start of the weekend, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook and Twitch. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, I implore you. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, Comment, email them to bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487. And you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.